And we are live. Good evening. My name is Sam Davis and welcome to the latest in the interview series on Back of the Net where we chat to people who've been associated with the Cherries. Uh, and this person, well, he has quite a bit. Probably one of our standout performers over the last decade or so. Of course, you've seen it promoted on Twitter and Facebook. It is Mr. Mark Pugh. He's standing by and uh, also with us is Alex Deutsch, Season Cherry. You've probably seen him on Twitter. Love some of his tweets. And um, also Jeff Hayward. He's here as well. So if you're watching on Facebook, uh, do feel free to like our page and give this post a like. And also on YouTube, why not smash the thumbs up and also subscribe as well, because it'll alert you to our next video. Uh, we may have a cheeky bonus in the week, but next Sunday we're chatting to another seasoned cherry from Mark Pugh's era as well. So stay tuned for that. So I hope these videos are helping to get you through the lockdown. This week, uh, we're pleased to be sponsored by Living Home Tech, a company that themselves are helping to make isolation that little bit more manageable with their technology solutions. Spending more time at home makes you realise just how much we all need reliable technology for entertainment, video conferencing, gaming and more. And Living Home Tech, well, they're professionals in the design and installation of cinemas, networks, lighting, security systems and much more for your home that work every time and look, feel and sound great too. You can experience Living Home Tech at livinghometech.co.uk. And I've got to say, I wish I had one of their uh, living home techs room in a room cinemas um, in this lockdown because they could take any spare room in the house, uh, reskin it and add a cinema or media room. How good would that have been for AFCB TV yesterday? Reliving that Charlton versus Bournemouth match. Um, what a game it was. And the person we've got tonight, well, he played a big part in that match. And of course, the season as a whole that helped us enjoy an experience incredible scenes like these. Wow. So I am really pleased to introduce Mark Pugh to you. Mark, how are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good. How how are you coping during lockdown? Uh, you know what? Everyone's in the same boat. I'm just trying to keep a smile on my face and trying to keep fit, keep healthy. Um, and as a footballer, we don't get to spend as much time as, you know, as we, we just try and spend as much time with the family as possible. It's difficult because we're travelling to games, that kind of thing, um, you know, in our weekly schedule. But I'm just enjoying my time with my family. Yeah, it's a difficult period. Can't wait to kick a ball around again, but, um, you know, making the most of the time with the family. Good stuff. Also this week, we've got Alex Deutsch. Alex, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. Battling through. Um, really bored, uh, generally, but <laughs> <Would it be, laughs> each uh, week goes by. Them. So, okay. Would it be a fair assessment to say you're missing the football? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that would be fair. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, just week in, week out, just looking forward to having football back. And uh, these are really nice sort of um, things to look forward to. These, So I'm looking forward to chatting with you, Mark, and, and having a discussion. And yeah, also with us, we've got Jeff Hayward. Jeff, how's it going? Yeah, not bad, Sam. Thanks for thanks for having me on again. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, so Mark, tonight we want to sort of go through chronologically and um, detail your time with the club and speak about everything you're doing on and off the pitch. Um, but let's wind back to your time pre Cherries. And can you sort of tell us about your football as a youth and how you ended up at Dean Court? Yeah, it's, uh, it's it was a hell of a journey, really. Um, I spent. Um, two years with Burnley as a YT, uh, a lot of ups and downs. Um, from 16 to 18, I was playing as a striker, as uh, scoring a lot of goals. I was I was a I was a key performer in the youth team and reserves. Um, and it got to 18. I haven't really had you know much much football, much training with the first team. Um, I was doing really well on the stand tournament at the time. He was. Um, he was a real admirer of me. I was on the bench at Villa Park at 16 in, in a Carling Cup, it was back in the day, in a Carling Cup game. Um, and then a change of manager, um, 
looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Basically said I wasn't good enough. Um, and, you know, it, it released me. But looking back, it made me such a stronger character. Um, it gave me that kick up the backside to, you know, look, look at myself in the mirror and say, look, I really need to uh, make something of this now. I went to Bury. Um, they gave me a year contract. I played 40-plus league games in League Two um, with them. Um, had a really good year. Um, and then they offered me a contract, um, but through the town, they'd moved into a new stadium at the time. They came in and offered me a three-year contract. So I thought, great opportunity, moving away from, you know, with my wife. Um, and um, we thought, we'll, we'll have a real good go at this. And after two years, another change of manager um, told me I wasn't good enough. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it seems to be a regular theme at the minute. Um, I was actually on my honeymoon. Um in my third season and I got a phone call to say I was, I was getting paid up. Um, you know, I wasn't needing any more. So that was like, wow, come on. Um, and then after two days, my agent called me saying Hereford were interested in taking me. Um, so this was when I really started to take it seriously. I was like, look, I need to make something of this now. I, it's all I ever dreamt about um, as a young boy. I wanted to be a professional footballer, and that was my aim. And that season, I scored three goals against Bournemouth, two in the home fixture, and one at Dean Court. And uh, <laughs> the man himself, Eddie Iler, he dis- decided to take a punt on me, and the rest is history. Was that your plan, Mark? Did you aim to score lots of goals to impress Eddie and get that dream move to Bournemouth? <laughs> it seems that way, yeah. Um, I mean... <sighs> He's just he's just got an incredible way with players. And um, the first day I met him, I mean, I drove down to Bournemouth and uh, we were saying to ourselves, wow, this is a long way. Because originally from being up north, it, it took us six and a half hours. But we met him. We went for a lovely meal in Prezzo. They like to, uh, <laughs> they treated us, treated us to a Prezzo. And we instantly connected, um, not just on a personal level, his philosophy, the way he wanted to play. Um, it was just... It was just a match made in heaven and um, we grew from strength to strength. Um, our relationship, uh, not only on the field, but off the field, is um, it's still amazing now. Mm, good stuff, Alex. Do you remember uh, his goal against us? Because I, I must admit, I can't. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I feel, if I remember rightly, I, I could be wrong. I, I feel like it, you went... You, you nutmeg the keeper, but I'm not. <laughs> you, 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 you know what? It. it was a very long time. <laughs> you know what? I always have a joke because I'm good friends with Shranjalal, actually. he uh, I always joke with him saying, You got me my move to form a few days. I got played uh, played in behind defence and he came charging out and uh, he tried smashing me and nutmeg him and had a free tap in the goal. So, um, no, yeah, that, good memory, by the way. Yeah, it's good to know that you remember it. That's what uh, Clark asked us. And also, um, Neil Dawson, we were briefly talking about uh, the early stages of Eddie. Do you think that performance helped you seal the deal? Uh, yeah, because I know um, the, the scout, Des Taylor, who was watching me at the time, um, he came to watch me that evening. Um, and I think he watched me on seven or eight other occasions. He uh, he still claims to this day that he got me my move to Bournemouth. He was scouting me and uh, he says, I've seen you, uh, you had a nightmare one game, but I told Eddie how you still got ability. So, <laughs> But um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think it did play a massive part because at the end of the day, you... You only get certain opportunities in football. You can be, you can have a really poor four or five games, and then the right person can be watching you the next game. Um, you can play really well, score two goals, and get your move from that. That's what it's all about. I mean, um, you can have all the the talent in the world, the ability, but if you don't perform on the right stage, then you're not going to, you know, get the move you deserve. Hmm. And did you think that the move? might not happen because it went to a tribunal and I think didn't Jeff Mostyn describe it as uh, an excessive £100,000 fee at the time? <laughs> yeah, he was absolutely chewing actually. Uh, he thought I was an absolute rip-off. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what, We I went to the tribunal with Jeff, uh, we went on the train together. All I can say is what a guy, he has done so much for that football club and I'm literally... I can't. I haven't got enough words. I, I probably we've only got an hour, an hour and a bit on here. I, I probably need a bit longer. So we went on this incredible journey, uh, train journey to London. Had a load of banter. Um, 
you know, he found out how much it was and he was absolutely shell shocked. So he, Jeff being Jeff, the only thing he could do was uh, take me to Selfridges and uh, buy me a lunch in there. And uh, he was sat there with a little glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but no, he's, he was. He did say it was excessive, but no, I am. Um, you know, hopefully, I've um, I've justified that fee. Oh, I Do you think the chair? So. I think it might have been one of the best hundred thousand pounds we've ever spent. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, you found the transition um, fairly easy, given that Hereford were a club that had its own financial issues. Yeah, they, were, they had a lot of financial issues, and um, I was really sad to see them uh, go under like a few years back. Now, um, I always keep an eye out for you know for them, and obviously Bournemouth now have left. But um, yeah, it was um, it was really interesting because um, at the time Bournemouth didn't have a lot of money. They were they were on the up when I signed in League One, and um, that League One season um, it was it was a real test for me personally and a lot of the other lads because. Uh, we were probably one of the favourites to go back down. Um, and I was told I wasn't good enough for League Two, let alone League One. So um, to test myself against better players, that's what you want to do as a footballer. You want to test yourself against the best. And that team in League One, most of that team went up to the Premier League. And that was just testament to, you know, one of my favourite players quotes um you know basically um hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard it's um it's what i live by i mean you can have all the talent all the talent in the world but if you don't work hard you're not gonna you know be the best version of yourself yeah, good stuff yeah sorry alex no, you obviously right from the start you're really <coughs> popular with the fans um and it was quite clear that all the fans absolutely loved you. Um, but how quickly did you realise that we were actually singing Pew rather than, you know, <laughs> you? I thought, I think I scored my first goal against Peterborough and they started booing and I was like, what's going on here? I scored a goal. But uh, no, it, um, basically it took me a couple of games to realise that. But no, it's, <laughs> it's still spine tingling now. I mean, especially when I when the show first started and you hear the Bolton commentary and obviously people chanting your name, that's what you live for as a footballer. You want to put smile, smiles on fans' faces and just just make them happy. You, as long as you're going out on that football field, giving your all, win, lose, or draw, um, that's all you can ever do. I mean, me, losing's the most frustrating thing in football, but I always say if you lose a game, it's you're not a loser. It is an opportunity for you to grow as a person and you know go home spend time with your family yeah forget about it on the saturday night but once monday comes around analyze your performance and just work out where you've gone wrong to be better the following week and as long as you're giving everything for the cause and you know then that's all the fans want playing under ready you uh, you had quite a prolific start to that season in div one mark and the, the team was playing well but how quickly did you become aware of the speculation around Eddie and, and how difficult was it to play with that speculation going on? Yeah, I was absolutely devastated when he left. Um, devastated because um, I signed for Bournemouth for Eddie Howe, um, you know, and um, I, he got the best out of me as a player. Um, and yeah, it was tough to take at the time and it took us a real while to get going again. I think we were... Um, I think we're sitting in our second season once he'd left. I think we're sitting about 19th in League One at the time. And then he came back and uh, we just went on an incredible run again to get promoted that season. Um, and being completely honest, I didn't know what was happening with my future because I just I wasn't as happy. Uh, Bradders was incredible. Bradders was brilliant. Um, and um, Brooksy and Groves, he came in. They'd done a really good job. And... Uh, I think people underestimate the signings they made. They made some great signings, but they didn't make the team gel like the gaffer did, Eddie. He just, his attention to detail is absolutely phenomenal. He he, he deserves all the plaudits he gets because he works tirelessly behind the scenes. I don't, I don't think, people know he works hard, but <laughs> he's on another level. And not only him, his coaching staff, JT, Perchy, Tinners, um, you know, they're all absolutely brilliant. And that's why the club, along with obviously all the hard work everyone puts in and the players have done an incredible job there, um, 
it's a lot of it is down to him and his, his coaching staff. It's interesting because uh, when Bradbury, you know, took obviously it was devastating for us Bournemouth fans when Eddie left, and we, we we were just not sure whether Lee Bradbury would be up to it. But for the first ten games at least, we did all right and we were unbeaten. But then our season soon unravelled a bit, and we uh, we were picking up a few sort of bad results. But in the end, we managed to hold on to the sixth place spot. Can you? enlighten us on the differences between Bradbury's management style compared to Eddie's or was he very much in the Eddie mould? I think um, I think Brad was was really good to be honest he was he was excellent but Eddie's shoes are, are so big to fill um, he's he's been tooted as like an England manager and rightly so he's absolutely incredible and um, yeah I mean <clears throat> you can't pinpoint where it was going wrong I think it was just Overall, um, I think the attention to detail in training and the hours uh, the gaffer Eddie spent on the training ground and his coaching staff with his players, he wanted to develop players and he um, he's on another level. He's on a, he's, it's nothing against anyone, Bradders, Grovesy, Brooksy who came in because they were very good, but Eddie Howe is on another level. How close did you come to leaving when Eddie left? Because uh, obviously Marvin Bartley went with him to Fulham, uh, to Burnley, not Fulham. Feeney and Robinson also left. So were you were you thinking, you know, I might I might go too? No, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I was enjoying my football. I was I was playing some really good football, um, and you know, sometimes players maybe jump a little too soon. Where I am really proven myself for a full season at League One when the gaffer went. Yeah, I'd had a really good start and I was scoring goals for fun. I was flying. And I was, uh, when he moved to Burnley, being a Burnley fan, um, I thought he was going to take me with him. And part of me was devastated at the time because I really did want that move to Burnley and I wanted to go with Eddie Howe. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. And, there was a reason for me not going to Burnley. I think he signed another winger at the time instead of me. Um, and the reason was to, to be on this incredible journey with Bournemouth, um, make the incredible friends I've, I've made um, at the club, um, you know, have a great relationship with the fans, be successful, get into the Premier League with Bournemouth. And there was unfinished business there. And it was just him coming back. I think it spurred everyone on to make that final push. Obviously, there was a quite a period where um, there was a contract on the table, and and you you continued to play with such professionalism, and you carried yourself so brilliantly the whole time. Um, but when when Howe came back, you um, I mean, pretty quickly decided that you know you were you were going to stay. What was it about Howe returning that made you sign and and, and commit? Um, just his ambition. I mean, I'm an, ambi I'm an ambitious person. I believe still to this day that I'm going to play in the Premier League again. Um, and Eddie, you know, instilled that self-confidence and belief in his players. Um, he knew what direction he wanted to push in, the style of play he wanted to play suited me down to the ground. He wanted me and Chaz, we just, we had the best understanding and relationship, you know, I think there's been in the Championship uh, not being too biased for it, but uh, uh, I enjoyed playing with Chaz every week. Um, I think that team, it just clicked absolute like it must have been a pleasure to watch as a, as a football fan. Because really was, yeah. it, it was, uh, it was so enjoyable to play in and um, seeing the games back, seeing the goals we used to score. Um, but yeah, um, just the sessions he put on, it was so enjoyable and it brought out the best of you on, on a field on a Saturday you implemented them sessions and you, you basically you, say you were playing Birmingham, you'd know their strengths, weaknesses, and you'd know how to cut them open. And we did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, no, I've, I've, like I say, I've not enough time to say all the words I've got to say about um, the gaffer, Jason, his coaching staff. Um, it's, he, he brought life back to the football club along with, a lot of hard work is behind the scenes because I think people forget about, you know, the amount of people that put their hands in the pockets to keep a club, club alive. And, you know, me personally, I'm, I'm grateful for everyone that, grateful to everyone that has helped this football club achieve their dream. 
Brilliant. Given so the... we had a message. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Jeff, I was about to say, Jeff, just before we move on to that, um, your yeah. next point, um, because I know you want to mention a certain person that Pewy proved wrong, don't you? Um, we had a message from AFC Beer who said that he, you know, he was convinced that you were off following what he thought was an extended <coughs> hand clap after the Huddersfield game um, at their place, and obviously he's so glad, like we all are, that you stay. But also, he sent a message to say your old head teacher, Mike Brennan, sends his regards. He has watched your career with great interest. Is that a name oh, you remember? Yeah, I remember him really well. I mean, me and my wife went to the same school and uh, we loved uh, Mr. Brennan, as, as we called him back, um, mm. back in the day. And uh, now that's really touching, actually, to hear that people, especially teachers from a school, are still watching my career closely. Um, and he was such an amazing guy. Um, he, was a, he was a great head teacher and uh, we loved him to bits. That's really nice to hear. Mm. So, Mark, given the fact that you were a regular starter week in, week out in League One, um, what would you like to say to Gary Peters, the Shrewsbury manager who told you you weren't good enough in third you know, football? <laughs> you know what? Gary Peters was uh, was brilliant. It was when he got sacked. I, uh, I got told I wasn't good enough. Well, he left the club. And um, you know what? This is re- Paul Simpson took over um, at Shrewsbury and he, he told... He never said the words I wasn't good enough. Um, that was the Burnley manager. I won't go into too much details with that. <laughs> but um, basically, Paul said to me, he said, look, you know, I haven't got a place for you in my team. Um, and then we had we had a chat. We went into a little bit of detail. Well, when I was on my honeymoon, so that was a bit uh, <laughs> not the best timing. But, um, you know, it, everything happens for a reason. And I wouldn't have gone to Hereford and scored three goals that season against Bournemouth. Um, but since then, um, Paul Simpson, he was um, assistant manager at Derby when we uh, when we got promoted that season. And he pulled me in the tunnel and he said to me, look, you proved me wrong. So that's all I ever want to do. I want to prove people wrong. And I'll probably, I, I want to prove people wrong to this day. I mean, they probably say, you know, he's gone to the championship. He can't get back up into the Premier League, but I believe I can. You've got to have that self-belief and confidence if you're going to achieve anything, whether it be a businessman, whether it be, you know, someone. Uh, you just got to want to be the best version of yourself and be as successful as you can because once you stop growing, what's the point in, in doing it anymore? You want to grow as a person, as an individual. I've got a I've got a bit of a loaded question for you, Mark, and I'm playing devil's advocate somewhat. I'm going to show you a graphic, right? So when Eddie came back, uh, you played in 15 consecutive games and we didn't lose a single match. And then you missed a week where we lost 3-1 at Walsall. Uh, next week, you came back straight into the side and we got back to winning ways, uh, winning five in a row. Um, now, whilst I know that you're the consummate professional... <laughs> Is there a little part of you that kind of internally smiles knowing that? It's got to be, surely. It's that's, not, that's not rocket science, that, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, to, be, to be fair, I have that joke with, uh, with the QPR boys this year. I think we've only lost one game I started. So I still, uh, I've got a little bit of a good omen there. Uh, but no, that, that gives me great satisfaction. That oh, does. good. <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. So you're talking um, about uh, the fact that uh, promotion was achieved and uh, it wasn't how we wanted it, though, was it, Alex? No, it was, a, it was one of the most surreal games ever, wasn't it? And I think everyone ran onto the pitch at Tranmere thinking that, <laughs> that we'd done it. Um, and, yeah, it obviously wasn't meant to be. A couple of years later, we, we made up for it. But I, I know that behind the scenes with um, you know the investment, uh, there were real aims and ambitions to reach a top flight. Um, but as players, how realistic did you think those those achievements could be? As, you know, our ground had three sides. Um, we had small crowds how, how realistic do you think that was um we always believed as players i mean we got doubted a lot and especially in our first season in the championship we we were told we were going to get relegated that kind of thing and we didn't set off great and then we got a couple of results together and we hoped that we puffed that first season and we never really reached the heights we know we could um but like I said, we kept believing. We had a great manager. We had a great work ethic about the squad. Um, gym work throughout the week. Sessions were spot on. And um, 
that takes you a long way. I mean, you can have, you see the millions that have been spent, but if you haven't got a great attitude amongst the squad, great characters in that dressing room, then it's going to be a real struggle. I mean, when you're going to, playing away from home, you need the characters that are going to be nitty gritty, they'll break up play. They'll, and we had a great balance, a, a great work ethic, along with a lot of great quality. And um, like I said, we just never stopped believing. We uh, we had a lot of belief in each other. Um, and I think that's important. I mean, if, if there's a defender behind you, you need to know you're going to trust your teammate with that football. And we had a lot of technically gifted players that could deal with it. And um, I think in the second season, moving on from that, the turning point was when we hammered Fulham 5-1 away from home on TV and Fulham were a good team and we absolutely battered them and we were really starting to believe them. During that first season, we signed Tequila Ranti and then before that second championship season, Callum Wilson. Um, both had contrasting uh, fortunes at the club. So any ideas why that would be? I think um, Tequila Ranti was a... He's a, he was a very talented player, and in training some days you'd be thinking, "Where did that come from?" He uh, he scored that goal against Burnley, nearly broke the net, great finish, um, and he had glimpses. He was quick, he was sharp. I think coming over from you know South Africa, um, he was playing. I think he was playing there at the time when I'm not uh, over there. And it, it's it's really difficult when you're moving away from your family. You probably had a lot going on in the background, which was quite difficult for him but he had a lot of ability there but Callum Wilson's Callum Wilson and he's you know powerful strong scores goals everything you want in a striker and he's he's continued that rich vein form funnily enough bef I think about a year before we actually signed him I seen him play on TV for Coventry I think he scored a hat-trick that day and I thought oh this kid looks a real player so um you know, we signed him and um the first glimpses I got of him was um Torturing other fields defence um, in that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Well, Callum, I was, Callum. I was about to say, you mentioned the Fulham match, which was obviously the second championship season. The way that season started, I mean, what was it, 25 seconds before uh, you hit the net? At what stage in that season are you thinking that promotion is really possible? I think the Birmingham game. Um, I mean, uh, great memories for me getting my hat trick, but as a, I had an absolute beast first half as well I couldn't trap a bag of cement to be honest I couldn't control the ball I was having a nightmare but uh you know in another circumstance I could have been dragged at half time but I went on to score the three goals and uh we hammered them that day and uh, I think we we're only we weren't winning by we we're only winning by a small margin first half um but yeah after that game the celebrations after you could just feel it amongst the, the squad that we were going to achieve something for a winger, Mark, you scored a lot of headed goals, didn't you? Was that something you worked on in training? And I was just watching the big man Fletch, weren't it? I just wanted to be like him. <laughs> I, I haven't got his tan, though, to be honest. So. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, to be honest, I worked a lot, um, especially when I played with Matty on the other side, because you knew it was coming in the box. He was going to check. He was going to whip. Frano got me a lot of assists as well that season. It wasn't by chance. I mean, we worked on it a lot. I mean, combination play out wide. Um, you know, we we worked endless, we worked hours just uh, improving our game and knowing what the lads were going to do on the field. We we needed to be in the right place at the right time to score the goals. And as soon as Mighty Check, like I said, I was back stick to try and get the headed goals and Frano go to the byline and cross the ball, no, no messing about. So, yeah, it, it, it was not by chance. We worked a lot on that. We always see you as a, as a nice guy off the pitch. Um, it would be fair to say you also show it off, uh, sorry, on the pitch as well, because uh, I had this message from Ben to say, you know, you could have had the penalty at Birmingham, yet you decided that Ramsey, who was, you know, not in the best form, let's say, um, and he managed to score it, then he notched another, yet, fortunately for you, you got your hat-trick anyway. Was that... One of the only hat tricks you scored in your career, or have you scored any others? Yeah, professionally, I mean, I'd scored a lot in youth team reserve and obviously Sunder League and that, but <laughs> that's not exactly hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, TK was going, um, he was going through a bit of a rough patch. He hadn't scored in a while, and I think it 
it was the right thing to do because at the end of the day, it's not about me, it's about the team and uh, we wanted to achieve promotion and by getting the confidence up of all the players on a week-to-week basis, that was the most important thing and, you know, it helped us flourish in the end and, um, yeah, I think that was the right thing to do and thankfully it dropped to me from a hat-trick. Yeah, wow. Um, numerous people actually talk about the uh, togetherness of the squad that season. And uh, Callum Davis, he's got in touch and he submitted this question, uh, which asks why you think it was so successful. So this was his question. Pewy, mate, I hope you're all good. Uh, my name's Callum and uh, you're definitely someone that I'd describe as a, a true AFC Bournemouth legend. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate, watching you over the years. And uh, the question that I've got is, what do you feel that the number one thing was that made that team so special obviously moving up through the leagues and the championship and then ultimately the prem um so i hope you're all good mate and keep up with what you're doing no thanks for that buddy i mean that's a really good question i think um the willingness to work hard for each other as, as a team we we weren't footballers that was earning lots of money you know back in league one and even the championship we we wanted to be successful as a team we wanted you know, we had we saw that end carrot goal. We wanted to, you know, look, look after our families. We wanted to work hard. And for me personally, um, when I had my my children, look, I, that was my goal. I wanted to make them proud of me, um, and I wanted to go out on the football field and you know give it my all for them because I wanted to be successful that, for them. And I think at that time we had, you know an unbelievable work ethic and the willingness to you know reach for the top and when we started winning games in the championship and we we were saying on a week-to-week basis look there's no team we actually fear in this league we're the best team by far we're looking because the gaffer's really big on stats we're looking at statistics we were out passing teams by two three hundred passes we were creating more chances and you know the the attention to detail um, on the opposition, on we we just nailed it down, and I'm a firm believer that small percentages really matter, and we were making them percentages really count. I mean, if you're working, you know, on a week to week basis of improving one two percent of your game as a team as an individual, then <laughs> come the end of the season, you're going to be you know quids in. So yeah, I mean, in answer. Uh, the work ethic, the work ethic, the talent, com- the and the talent combined. What did you like about the side that season, Alex? And which was your standout performance in the? Okay, let's put aside the eight 0 because that was pretty good. But what were your, you know, to- especially the second half of the season, we were putting in some worldies, weren't we? Yeah, I think the Blackpool games. Um, I know they weren't particularly. Uh, they, they were struggling at the time, weren't they? But you know, it, it was just the manner in which we just we were ruthless, and a lot mm. of teams would take. Their, their foot off the gas um, when they're a couple up, three nil up, but we didn't. We just kept going at them. I mean, Mark, were there any teams that you came against that actually you sort of you you felt that the team um, they surprised you, the opposition? Were there any teams that you know? I know there are a lot of um, research and a lot of um, te- you, you do all your your background tracks. Were there any teams that we came against in the championship where you thought, well, oh, we might have underestimated them there? We never underestimated anyone because if you don't perform on your day, you know, at the end of the day, they're professional footballers, so they're obviously there for a reason and they're good teams. We we always had a tough game against Derby County. I mean, we they had a real good team and they, they struggled in the playoffs a few a few years running actually. And but I always wondered why they weren't in the top two because they were always one of the toughest opponent, opponents we faced. They had some great quality in that squad. They had um, using midfield, um, great players now at Watford and um, good strikers. They had a great balance about the team. And um, yeah, I was really surprised that they didn't reach the heights they should have. Um, and we always found that a difficult game. It's um, interesting because the stars aligned towards the end of that season for us, like we sort of didn't really expect. It was very much up and down. And that game against Sheffield Wednesday and the last minute goal that we conceded. I mean, Adam Smith, Tommy Alfred was saying was in bits in the changing room. Um, But obviously, 
it worked for us and promotion you know, could effectively be achieved. Um, now, before we ask you about the memories of that game, uh, we had a question from Craig Beasley. Uh, he wants to ask you about your favourite moment as an AFC Bournemouth player pre-Bolton. So this is his question. Hi, Mark. Two questions. Since joining from Hereford in 2010, what would you say remained the same at the club? And second question, uh, what would you say was the highest point prior to the Bolton game? Good question. Very good question. Um, I think because I'm, I'm looking back now, I think the celebrations for me personally um, after Birmingham, I mean, on a personal note, Birmingham, hat-trick uh, is all I ever wanted to do as a professional football. I wanted to score that hat-trick. I wanted to, you know, just prove to people I was a good player. So for me personally, the Birmingham game, that's, that's an easy one. And then Oh, that's difficult. Um, mm, got me there. I suppose, like one of the things that you, Tommy said was that the one of the things that hasn't changed is just the ethos of the club. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, Eddie Howe's a constant in that, but it seems that you know everyone seems to be singing from the same hymn sheet. Is that would that be a fair assessment? I think so. Yeah, I think everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet for sure. Um, I'm, the biggest change in the club is obviously the facilities and. Um, you know, we we was when I first signed for the football club, we were training at Camford and we were we were having lunch on route. Um, you know, we we're having soup and sandwiches, that kind of thing. The nutrition side of things was second to none. Obviously, in the Premier League, your your recovery strategies, your fitness coaches, your your, your backroom staff was amazing. And look, <laughs> the fans haven't changed one bit. They've been amazing throughout, and um, you know they've helped the club be where they are today and um, I think as players we're really thankful for that support as well and um, yeah like I say uh, the ethos of the football club hasn't changed one bit um, and everyone just wants to bring success to, to a wonderful football club. Yeah now uh, Jeff we're going to ask you about how you felt pre-Bolton game because speaking of Tommy Elphick uh, he said there were no nerves whatsoever which I found hard to believe because I thought there might be some, but, you know, Mark's like shaking his head saying, you know, there were. Now, later on, um, if you've tuned in, thanks very much for tuning in and do remember to give this video a like and do subscribe to our channel. Later on, we're going to be talking about uh, what Mark's up to now, including food and Dan King. I know you put this uh, question to Pewie on Instagram <laughs> about his <laughs> of olives and his food dishes. I'm sure we'll move on to that as well. But Jeff, thoughts about Bolton? I mean, for me, I was I was nervous as hell. Yeah, I was nervous too, and I think we always, as a club, there was a there was something. Certainly, if you were a supporter from the seventies and eighties, that the, there was this rumor, this chat that the club never really believed in itself or wanted success. So uh, it must have been amazing to to get to the Bolton game, think all we got to do is get a result here and we're, and we're promoted to to the Premier League. I mean, how did how did the players feel? Because it was something that was historic, historic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, winning breeds confidence. I mean, we were winning games and we were going into games like saying to each other, look, obviously nothing's set in stone. We go out, we work hard, we win this game because we had the, the ability, we had the confidence, the belief going into every game that we were too good for anyone. And it's all about the way you approach things. And it's not being you know, big-headed, anything like that. It's just having that confidence to go out and show people that you are talented um, we wanted to do it for the fans. We wanted to do it for the, the town and for ourselves, for our families. Um, a lot of that team had come from the lower leagues, had worked their way up, and it was really important to us because everyone's got a journey and everyone's got a story. And a lot of the lads in that dressing rooms have either been released from a club, told they're not good enough, and. I think that was a carrot at the end of it for us all. We wanted to prove them people wrong and give it a real good crack and be in that Premier League. Great, uh, great night. One at Alex three 0 Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think there was a my entire um, sort of Bournemouth supporting career has always been um, well. Yeah, we've hardly been a glory hunter flat fan base, have we? And I, that just that the build up to that game felt unimaginable. It felt it, it was just it, just something that I can't I can't describe. I don't even think there was nerves. It was a just a feeling of sort of disbelief. Um, and yeah, when your when your shot went in, 
of the the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> nothing I've ever heard. Nothing I've ever heard. The, the the ground was rocking, and and you know, just what what a game. I it, it will live with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's what football is all about. It's about creating memories, and you know, like I said before, putting smiles on people's faces. Uh, have you got a sombrero picture or what? <laughs> I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. Been a long yeah. time now, I'm sure. But, uh, no, I mean, looking back at the footage and um, the celebrations after, that's what it's all about. I mean, um, things like this don't happen often in football, especially to a small club like Bournemouth. That rise to the Premier League, it's an incredible story and it'll live long in the memory bank, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just proud and honoured and um, blessed to be a part of that. Where where did the idea come from? Someone must have thought, right, I'm going to put two A4 pieces of paper. I'm going to type Premier in New Year's, uh, sorry, in Times New Roman. I'm going to laminate it and I'm going to blue tack it to the front of a Mexican hat. <laughs> Who's thinking of that? Oh, I don't know. It's pr- oh, a great idea, though. You know, someone asked me the other day, have I still got the sombrero, actually? And uh, it went missing. Some uh, people for fortune now, uh, whoever's got that. <laughs> How um how kind of uh, wary were you of some of the moments you might not have seen? For instance, the change in romantics with uh with Jeff Mostyn and Callum Wilson's uh slap of the backside. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he set himself up for that. He set himself up for that. But no, um, I knew he'd be at the heart of it. He loves the celebrations afterwards. And uh, mm. oh, looking back at the footage, it just um it gives you huge pimples now. And uh, that was what a night. I mean, the Charlton game and going up as champions was amazing but the celebrations after Bolton game the time was buzzing we went out we had a laugh together um we had a great night and um it's just I, I was lost for words to be honest after that it was a big blur for two weeks and then obviously we had the the uh the, the bus and uh it's a blur it is a blur and uh it actually seems ages ago now to be honest it's funny because we had this question about were you surprised by the amount of people who actually turned out because the scenes were amazing. This is uh, Daryl who submitted the question. And as a player, you're probably thinking, you know, this club's got potential with the amount of fans that have turned up. Mental. I couldn't believe how many turned up, to be honest. It was absolutely amazing. I thought there'd been one man and his dog, but <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, oh, it was, it was mental. And um, I didn't know what to expect because I've never experienced anything like that before. But what a set for it. The Bournemouth Beach is a place to be, isn't it? Especially when the Cherries get promotion to the Premier League. Was that the occasion, Alex, where you tried to start a uh, TK Ranty chant, but it didn't, it didn't go down <laughs> too well with the people behind you? Yeah, it was just me on my own. Um, I don't know if any, anyone had sort of heard of him. I don't know. Or <laughs> uh, maybe maybe they just felt very, very uncomfortable. Um, yeah. But no, it was... Uh, it was, it's just amazing seeing how many all those people there. Well, I, I, I don't know if they ever said in a sort of a rough estimate of how many people actually were there, but it it just stretched for miles down that beach, miles. Mm. Yeah, it seemed to go on forever. It did. It did. Alex, did you think you know, like as a Bournemouth fan, you think right, you've reached the top level now. There's no way that we're going to be able to better this. At the time, did you think? Okay, we you know we've got a chance of staying in the Premier League, or do you think, well, we're probably going to do exactly what the media is saying? We'll have our you know, however many days out, and then we're going to go back down. What were your thoughts? Well, I thought exactly what you're saying when we got promoted to the Championship. I thought <laughs> for the you know for the first time in my form of support in life, we would got up to the Championship, and I was you know, if we if we if we stayed up for a season as long as we gave a good account of ourselves, I'd, you know. <laughs> Been happy as a Larry. So for someone to at that point, once we've been promoted, all bets are off. You know, we could have won the league, and you wouldn't surprise me anymore. It was just uh, how how we could go from the position we were in to the championship, and I, we we sort of looked back on that the promotion to the championship not so long ago. And I remember just thinking, it doesn't get better than this. It doesn't get better than seeing my team finally be in the championship. Something that you know we've we've always sort of flirted with. Um, and to finally, finally do it and then to get promoted to the Premier League, I, you know, you could have asked me, yeah, I, I just had no idea what was going to happen. But I actually, I actually, for the first time, I believe that, you know, if, if any team could stay up and make a big account of themselves and basically prove everyone wrong, it was going to be this squad. They've just, just, 
they worked so hard they gave everything um and yeah it was just it's just, i still can't get my head around it actually <laughs> and, um, it, it, jeff you're going to ask about the transition from you know the different divisions weren't you well, yeah, I, I think that, I don't know what the elite club is, but there must be there must be very few players, Mark, who've gone from League Two to League One to Championship to Premier League in such a short space of time. When you were still, you know, you were at your peak in League Two, and you were at your peak still in, when you got to the Premier League. So, how did that feel? And how also did those transitions did, did those transitions feel? Was it which was the toughest, or did it just all come naturally to you? You know what, I think the toughest was going from League One to the Championship in the first season because I'd never tested myself at Championship level before. And um, obviously, you, people people have doubted me and said I'm not good enough for the Championship. So you try and block the negative comments out and turn them into a positive and, you know, basically tell yourself, yeah, I am good enough. I, I, need, to, I need to prove to people I am good enough. But yeah, each... Each league, I mean, the Premier League is a different kettle of fish. The athletes in the Premier League, um, they look after themselves. They're, they're quick, they're strong. They're, uh, the football brain is just on another level. So, I mean, um, yeah, it really did hit on when we played Man City away <laughs> as well in that first yeah. Premier League season. I'm not sure whether it was the first or second Premier League season. I was on the bench and I came on after about seven minutes because Junior got injured. And I think I'd done 13 and a half K and I didn't, I probably touched the ball about five times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was an eye opener. But yeah, the, the, it's difficult when you go in playing against better players, but you've got to go on the football field and, and say to yourself, look, he's human, I'm human. I've got to come out on top and I've got to win my individual battle. And you've got to do that as a team. You've got to do that as a squad. And you've got to, show them characteristics if you want to be a professional footballer then they it's all right saying i'm going to do it but you've got to look yourself in the mirror on a day-to-day -day basis if you wasn't good enough on saturday you've got to tell yourself i need to be better the following week and that transition up the leagues i think we were doing that on a constant basis as a, as a team and as a group i'm big on visualization and i could tell the group of players they visualised success and um, hence why Bournemouth are doing as well as they are. But for the first two, well, for the first um, sort of couple of games, it didn't feel too great. I mean, as Tommy Elphick said a couple of weeks ago, we battered Aston Villa at home, but yet somehow ended up 1-0, uh, losing 1-0 to that Rudy Casted header. And then, yeah. you know, losing at Liverpool felt tough, given that Tommy himself <laughs> scored what I thought was a legitimate header. Um, it came to West Ham away. Um, and what a game that was. So we had a question from Simon Kay saying your chops and your Cruyff turns were epic. Did you model yourself on anyone and what's your favourite? Now, now, obviously we're mentioning that because you do a certain chop uh, in the second <laughs> half. But yeah, where's your playing style from? Uh, you know what? I worked a lot on my technical ability when I was younger. I was in an acad like a, a local academy where we worked on Cruyff turns, all, all different types of things. But it came really natural to me, to be honest. I mean, people say, oh, that's an unbelievable chop. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't I just, It just comes natural. And I think, yeah, the West Ham game, I think Jenkinson's still sliding now, isn't he? So... <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, to score my first Premier League goal in that West Ham game, it was incredible. And to win, I think Callum got his hat-trick as well. I was buzzing for him. And um, it was a big relief because it felt a long time coming that first win, especially when you mentioned the Villa game. We were brilliant and Gisted scored that heavy goal. And then Liverpool, really the, the phenomenal team. And But no, we went away to West Ham tough game and uh, we got we got a great win but yeah going back to the chops I mean yeah it just comes quite natural to me I go out I express myself I, I just show no fear I think that's the biggest thing when you go on the football field once you start having that self-doubt and mm, my first touch wasn't that good and again a bit anxious a bit worried about it then you're going to perform badly I just go out I chop once I chop twice if you tackle me I chop again so I just got to Keep doing what I know I'm good at and believe in myself. I think you even do it on the goal line in so many of your goals, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, to be honest, the gaffer Eddie used to have a go at me a little bit for chopping in my own penalty box, but I had to, I had to stop doing that. <laughs> do you, I mean, do you, you know, obviously, like you're into your food now, etc. Do you sort of, you know, walk to the fridge and do a step over and head to the smoothie maker, doing about turn left to right, step over? 
<laughs> What's it like? <laughs> oh, yeah, to be fair, you've got to throw the odd step over. I'm not kicking many balls around at the minute, all over the kids in the back garden. So, yeah, I'll, I'll get the lime on the floor and start doing step overs with the lime and the lemons. <laughs> no, but, no, you just got to, um, like I say, it comes natural. You've got to work at your game, don't get me wrong. But, yeah, my, it's, I just, I just love football and love going out and expressing myself, um, especially on a Saturday. I think it's true that um, Eddie loves wingers, and uh, you've you've played with him in all the the divisions um, coming up the league. But how challenging is it for you as a winger to play with Eddie's style? Because often he's playing you on the opposite side to your natural side, and and it seems to me that some players get that, but others struggle to adjust to it. Yeah, I mean, I like playing on the left wing because I can either come inside and shoot with my right. Uh, I'm, I've got quite a decent left foot standing cross so I really like playing on the left I think that's the norm now in football I think there's a lot of right footed players playing on the left because it's more difficult for defenders to deal with because they don't know what way you're going to go it's um, it's really hard for them to defend but you no know, we've had a lot of the, the talented wingers at the football club have been second to none I mean we've got we've had Mike Ritchie Ryan Fraser Junior Stanislas to name a few and you know we've it's always been unbelievable competition for places. You've obviously got the new lads there now as well, which I have I haven't spent too much time with, so I can't really comment on them. But it was so hard to keep um, you know, in the side on a week to week basis. I think that's why we've been so successful because we're pushing each other every week. Because if you had a bad game, you're out of that team and um you need to be at your optimal uh, optimum every week. Otherwise there's someone ready to step in, you know the following week so if you weren't performing you couldn't get in the team like I said it's um, it's difficult I mean as a winger you want to be the best best you can be and you don't want to get dropped no one wants to get dropped you want to be playing every week and anyone who says yeah I'm happy sitting on the bench not a chance mm, just that, that first season on. obviously we we, we finished 16th um, and I think no one really expected it today it was a particularly with the um you know we, we were written off from the start from the from the bookies and the journalists and then obviously our, our season was decimated by injuries um was that the biggest against all odds finish that you've had in football um yeah i think so i mean um before signing for Bournemouth, I, I was at Bury and then Hereford, where we were sort of scrapping it out at the bottom of the table, and it was always really difficult. I mean, we never really dominated games like we did because of our philosophy that, that the gaffer had. We we played free flowing football, but yeah, no, it was a it was a real eye opener because um, we really we were playing well, but we just weren't getting wins. And um, yeah, I mean, that was difficult. We need we needed to show mental togetherness and mental toughness uh, through that tough period and um, it was important we did that and you know the following season it um, it paid dividends. How did it feel to do a chop turn on Phil Jones and get brought down for a penalty at Old Trafford? <laughs> Great feeling and I got substituted because Sirs got sent off. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I still thank him to this day for that. But no, um, yeah, we we grinded out a great point there as well. And it, that was the one big man saved the penalty, didn't he? Mm, yeah, that's yeah, right. He Ibrahimovic's penalty. But yeah, great feeling, great feeling to win a penalty. And uh, it was my dream. I wanted to play at Old Trafford uh, since I was a young boy. And yeah. Um, that's what I say to young players now. I was a normal lad. I just kicked the ball around in the street and kick the ball against the wall. And my dream was to play in the Premier League. And um, it's still my dream now. I want to get back in the Premier League. I want to test myself against the best again. Yeah, I've hit a little bit of a stumbling block. Um, I've come down to the Championship and um, I'm at a great club QPR. But I want to take them back up into the Premier League. And um, I always say, um, and I stick by it, never get too high with a high, too low with the lows, because uh, it's really important that you stay grounded as a footballer. And if you're having good days, great. If you're having bad days, then, you know, learn from it and improve. Speaking of the big man who saved uh, that uh, penalty that time, we had Sean, uh, who's on the podcast. He says, what's, what's Arta like behind the scenes? Because we don't really get to see much of him. He's not really a man that likes to put himself in the media much. Uh, he, he seems like an interesting chap, said Sean. What's your, what's your view, Mark? I've got one word on Arta, legend. He's, uh, <laughs> he's, 
He's class. Um, you know, he, come, he comes across as this big, strong guy, but deep down, he's he's such a loving character. Um, he wants to win. I think that comes across in his character. He's, he comes across as a winner. Um, and, you know, he's, he's amazing. Um, to this day, training day in, day out, he's, uh, he's incredible. He wants to be the best every day. Um, he's a nightmare to try and score against in training because he, he makes the goal look small. He's a big man. But I... I can't say enough good words about Archer. I've got, I get on so well with him, and um, at his age, he's still, he's still in great condition, and he could play in the Premier League till he's forty-eight. He could. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. So yeah, we'll do some um, questions that have been submitted uh, from people. So I'll head to Alex shortly, but firstly, I'll go to um, Kirk. And uh, in terms of your opposition, yeah, we had this video. Uh, submitted by Kirk, who's who's asking us about the players you played against. So um, have a listen to this. But firstly, he wants to give you a bit of praise. So here we go. <laughs> Mark Pugh, an absolute legend on the pitch, but a top bloke off it as well. Quick story. My wife was driving the kids home from school one day when my boy noticed Mark Pugh coming out of a Costa Coffee with Sean McDonald. And um, they turned the vehicle around. My boy asked if they could have a photo. And my wife said that they were just the kindest men and they were happy to give a photo. Thank you for that, Mark, as I still remember my boy's happy face when I came home from work. My question for you, Mark, though, is who is the toughest fullback you have ever played against? And how many Cruyff turns would it take in one move, do you think, to end a fullback's career? <laughs> Great question. Great well, question. <laughs> Oh, firstly, thank you for that photo. I actually remember that picture and, um, you know, his kids were really cute and polite and uh, grateful for the picture as well. Um, so that was really nice to see. And um, But, yeah, toughest fullback that springs to mind immediately is uh, Antonio Valencia. Um, had everything. Uh, he was a winger back in the day, but then went to right back when I played against him at Old Trafford. Um, strong, quick, nightmare to get round. He was up and down. It didn't help that... United kept the ball for fun and he was playing really high. So you had to do all your defensive work as a wing, winger. So, yeah, he was really tough. And, yeah, it, it'd probably only take me one Cruyff turn to end someone's uh, career, to be honest. All I need is one. Uh, but, no, Valencia was tough. Really good player. Good stuff, Alex. Cool. Um, yeah, what would you say was your top moment at the club? Obviously, a bit of a cliche one. Um, what would you say is your overall top moment, if you could pick? Um, I think um, so. That basically, yeah, I'd go for um, staying up in the Premier League in the first season. I mean, that was the aim we wanted to. We didn't want to go up to the Premier League and stay there for one season, come back down and be a nearly team. Um, and yeah, staying up in the Premier League that first season was was a massive highlight um, mm -hmm. because we tested ourselves against the best, and we had some really tough games and we had some tough runs, but we stuck together and we grinded it out and stayed in the Premier League. So I'd, I'd say that first season. Technically, Mark, who is the best player that you've played with at Bournemouth? Apart from yourself, obviously you can't say yourself. Can I say myself? <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that's a really tough question because we've got some great technical players. And I'll say two names just for different reasons. I'll say Matty Ritchie just for pure technique with, with his left foot. Um, his volley goal, um, I think I don't even need to say too much more about that. Right. I think everyone remembers that. Um, technically, crossing ability second to none and then junior Stanislas um for different reasons uh 1v1 against defenders he's brilliant like step overs sharp um and when junior's fully fit bless him he's he's had a tough time with injuries recently and he deserves to be fit because he's such a dedicated professional and he wants to do well for the football club so um i mean technically excellent and he is uh, the ultimate professional as well what about the most underrated player that you played with at Bournemouth? Underrated? Well, I suppose that's just one of those players that, you know, gets on and, you know, does their yeah. job that doesn't particularly um, have any limelight as such. Yeah, Sirs. 
I'd say Sirs because Sirs dictates the football. Is is awareness, is passing ability, is ability to con control a game, and you know basically feet. As, as a winger, I was left winger and I used to come into the pockets and it was a nightmare for full. But I knew Serge was going to open out on his left foot, find space and find me. And then obviously Charles, me, the rest is history. But um, Serge is really underrated and um, he was great to play with. Hmm. Good stuff. So um, obviously you ended up moving away, Alex your thoughts around that time because it, it, it was horrible it was like eddie going wasn't it <laughs> yeah it was it was really i think um i think it says a lot when so many players are so um gutted about you leaving um i think it says a lot about you and and the impact you had on our club and and uh, from a fan's point of view um you know you were you know a, a, you were a joy to watch um yeah what was what was the, what happened? Um, you know, how did the loan to Hull work out? How how were things at QPR? Yeah, so um, devastated to be honest. I was I was really devastated to leave Bournemouth. It was a really difficult decision. Um, it got to around um, I can't remember the exact dates. It was around October where I hadn't played much football. I wasn't in the squads. I was training well, working hard. So me and the gaffer. Um, we had an honest relationship. We had um, we had an honest conversation, and I said to him, "I said, look, I'm coming into my last year in my contract. Um, I'm not even been in the squads. I need to play some football. Um, you know what's what's happening with me? Where, where where do I go from here?" And he just said, "You're training really well. You're, you're working hard. Um, we'll just see where the next few months go. And if you haven't played any games, any minutes, then we'll look to get you some games in January." So. I just got my head down, worked hard. It was difficult, and um, uh, it got to a point in November where you know I said, "Look, I'd love to stay around here forever. I don't mind fighting for my place. I, I, I believe I, I'm good enough to play in this team, and um, you know I'd, I'd love to stay around here forever. But I'm coming into my last year, and basically for one reason or another, I was told I w weren't going to get a new contract. Um, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know who it's down to at the end of the day, um, but. Yeah, it happens for a reason. And it came to January. Um, it was getting towards the end of the window. Hull came up. And I knew I needed to go out there and play some football. Um, Nigel Atkins, um, unbelievable bloke. Um, got on like an house on fire with him. He was um, a great man manager. And, uh, yeah, it was a tough start. I didn't play for six or seven games because they were on a good run. Um, they started to lose a few games. I had to work hard to get in the team. Um, and then I think I scored three goals, two assists in 10 starts. We start, we just missed out on the playoffs in the end. Um, and coming towards the end of that, it was really tough, actually, because I thought being on a free transfer, I'd, I'd maybe be able to get a club pretty sharpish. But it it was nearly the end of pre-season when QPR decided to take a punt on me. Um, obviously, weren't getting a contract at Bournemouth. Um, you know, being... I walked out to the fans to say my goodbyes and the gaffer, like, he pulled me in front of all the players and gave me an, a, a lovely speech in front of the boys, which had never been done before, which was really, you know, really nice and I absolutely loved it. So, yeah, it was really, really difficult. But, you know, in the end, I signed for QPR and uh, it's a wonderful club, uh, great fans. Um I've got a great squad. We're only six points off the playoffs at the moment and uh, six games unbeaten. And we can make a real push for it this year. If obviously, the football season get, gets back up and running. But as we all know, the health and safety of everyone involved in the world at the moment is the most important things. And um, yeah, football, everyone loves football to death, but we need to be, it needs to be safe to, to get back up and running. It's been a difficult season for your good mate Ryan Fraser, Mark. Um, what's your relationship like with Ryan, and and how, how have you been supporting him through uh, through his tough year? Yeah, I was messaging Ryan yesterday. Actually, um, he seems good. I mean, obviously, it's none of my business what's going on contract situation. That's not that's not my place. I don't ask him all the details of, of what's happening with him. And um, I just worry about what's happening on the field. So we've got a really good relationship. I care for Ryan a lot. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Like as a player, he reached such 
he, he reached the heights he reached last season were incredible. Um, I mean, scoring goals, getting assists, him and Callum, I think, were on fire together. And the expectancy level has been massive this year. And um, going into his last year of con his contract, never easy. So, um, yeah, I mean, my relationship with Ryan is brilliant. I think he's a great lad. Um, he's probably sometimes too honest. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I've only good things to say about Ryan. Well, give him our best, won't you? Yeah, I will do. I will do, yeah. I, I speak to him on a weekly basis, so, you know, I'll, I'll tell him he said hello for sure. Good stuff. So, um, someone, I'm just trying to find the comment now, because someone came in and said, you know, obviously you've got this kind of nice guy uh, streak on the pitch, but there was one uh, time against Middlesbrough where you sort of rubbed it in the face of your opponent somewhat with the scoreline and the photo has been very well publicised on uh, social media with the old, you know, 4-0. Um, do you remember that? Yeah, he kept kicking me every time I chopped him, so I had to give him a bit of stick. <laughs> 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 no, to be fair, um, yeah, it was a little bit of banter. I mean, it was probably done in the wrong way and it probably wound him up a little bit too much, but... Um, at the end of the day, we were four 0 up, and uh, he was giving me a bit of jib. So I thought I'd uh, <laughs> time the scoreline. <laughs> you touched Alex. it a minute. Yeah, you touched it a minute ago um, about obviously football's uh, taking a bit of a break at the moment. How do you think both the Premier League and football leagues should continue, um, or do you think we should void it and start again next season? What are, you, what are your thoughts on it? To be honest, I haven't really got. An opinion on it. Um, I mean, like I said, the health and safety is the most important thing. And uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people dying around the world. So I think we have to, you know, take that as a priority. And um, when we're told it's safe to go back to football, we've got to be ready as athletes. I mean, you've got to keep yourself fit. You've got to be ready. And uh, I'm going to be ready. Um, so, you know, Whenever that may be, I'm not too sure. And uh, we'll leave that to, to the people in charge to decide. Yeah, good stuff. It's, um, it's a real difficult situation at the moment. Now, I was just going to go through a few comments that have been received on Facebook. Uh, Dan Hall says, Mark Pugh is the coffee shop king. Ask him his favourite coffee shop. Do you want to enlighten us, Mark? Oh, I've got a few. Uh, my favourite overall is Cold Tea. Uh, yeah. Cold Tea in Westport. I'm great... Uh, Great mixture of salads, food, coffee, amazing. But to be honest, I've got too many to name. <laughs> Good stuff. So we might have to talk about um, your passion for food very shortly. But um, a number of people have asked questions about what your plans are after football. Now it's difficult because you're you're so, you know you're saying that you know your focus is getting QPR to the Premier League, which of course is you know like admirable because that's where you are at. But have you got a sort of long term plan in terms of what you want to do? Uh, when you retire and someone says yeah sorry any plans to play in the MLS says Nachos which is the North American Cherries overseas it's making me hungry now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I'd never say never um, I mean um, I've got a dream to play football as long as I can and I'm feeling better now than I did when I was 22 because I look after myself a lot better and you know, I've educated myself on how to stay fit, the right food, street, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, as regards to after football, I, I want to release a cookbook, uh, not only a cookbook, fitness, nutrition, not just for athletes, just for, for everyone. Uh, you've obviously, you've probably seen my Instagram page, The Foodie Footballer. So um, I just want to inspire people to be the healthiest versions of themselves and um, look, you don't have to eat like a rabbit to be fit and healthy. As long as you're working hard off of it, uh, as long as you're working hard in the gym and you're maybe going for walks and, and that kind of thing. I just want um, this to be, you know, encouragement to, to everyone that they can live a healthy lifestyle and um, feel good about themselves. I mean, there's nothing worse than whether you're going to work, work in an office and feel like you've got a bit of brain fog or you, you feel a little bit tired. So, yeah, I, I like the idea of working in football, but as regards to coaching, I'm not so sure whether that's my passion. I think um, along the route of maybe fitness, nutrition, that kind of thing. And, yeah, I'd love to work with football clubs maybe in the future, but who knows? I mean, you know, my dream is to still improve as a footballer. I feel like I have a lot more to give, uh, first and foremost, and then we'll see what the future holds. 
Well, when we spoke to Tommy a couple of weeks ago, he was quite keen to have a coaching role at, at the Cherries. So obviously, you know, two years from now, club dietitian. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, uh, everyone knows what I think about Bournemouth and the club and the fans. And, uh, you know, I've, I've a big heart for it all. And um, I've had some amazing memories, made some lifelong friends. And um, I've, I've still got a place in my heart for the fans. You know, we've been for a lot together. And like I said before, it was, it was such a difficult decision to leave. But for my football career, I, I had to do it at the time. And... Um, you know, I feel like it was the right one because it's brought me out of my comfort zone and I've set up my page. And like I said, I I probably wouldn't have done that if it was uh, driving 10 minutes down the road to training because I've spent a lot of time in hotels, a lot of time traveling. And um, I've had to use my time wisely because I feel like for myself, it's, it's benefiting my football and it's benefiting like the health of myself, my family. So, um, you know, I've used my time wisely and... Um, you know, see what happens. Mm. The good stuff, Alex. So um, are you a follower of the foodie footballer? I am, very recently, actually. Um, and, you know, I'm not much of a cook myself. Um, so it's, you know, I look at the recipes and I hope that um, I can follow them. Um, there is a quick question, um, and it really only requires a single word answer. Does ketchup belong in the fridge or not? Fridge. <laughs> 100%. When is it all in the fridge? <laughs> what, uh, so why? Yeah, tell us why. Just because it tastes nicer when it's a little bit cold. I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I really, to be uh, honest, I don't want to eat a lot of ketchup. Um, I'm more like if I have a, a little bit of a side sauce, I like sweet chilli jam, um, which, is, which is a winner, by the way. Highly recommend. But yeah... yeah. Whenever I've opened any sauces, chili jam, ketchup, it goes in the fridge. What? Do you like the Mark Bennett special of uh, chili jam on sourdough with a bit of avocado on top? Oh, bang on that, innit? Love it. Absolutely <laughs> love it. It's my favourite. <laughs> there's a few locals that have tried that on. Mm. Uh, South Coast Rose, Bosca Nova, a few yeah. of my favourites. They do a good one. It's, so, it's, I mean, uh, yeah. So, I mean, where did this passion for food all all sort of come from, or has it all has it always been there? Uh, been there? You've just sort of recently been inspired, or what? You know what? Six years ago, um, I think it was six, seven years ago. Now, I've done a nutrition course, um, an eighteen module course, and I learned an awful lot. Um, it covered a, a wide range of subjects, died, um, from the digestive system, body fat, metabolism. Um, you know, recovery strategies, bit of everything really. And I looked more and more into it. And um, it was around that time we had our second child as well. Um, and it was my way of helping out around the house because obviously our family are from up north. My wife had a lot on her plate with, with the two kids. And um, I just, I got a real passion for it. I, I was absolutely terrible cook probably eight, nine years ago. I thought tuna soup was a good meal. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But um, no, no, literally, I just, I, I got a real passion for it. And I, I, I'm reading books to this day, like on different spices. Um, I like trying new things. And uh, I just like, if I like the look of food, I want to eat it. And I want to give people that insight of the foods I eat. And look, you don't have to eat like a rabbit to have a good body fat. And um, I'd never say to someone, you should eat this kind of food because everyone's body's different. I mean, someone might be intolerant to gluten, to, to dairy, and ev everyone needs fueling differently and everyone needs different recovery foods. So it's about trying different things and working out what works best for you. Here's another one for you there, Mark. What is your favourite dish using caramelised onions? <laughs> I used to love the prezzo garlic bread with caramelised onions, so we have a little bit of banter about that one, me and Steve. Um, yeah, that used to be one of my favourite dishes before I actually started taking my diet a bit seriously. I was 23, 24 at the time. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, garlic bread. <laughs> Absolutely, love it. We also had a comment from Al Gard who said, I'm a chef but was rubbish at football. You seem to be brilliant at both. Are there any plans for a TV show in the future? Maybe Gordon, Gino and Mark or a chain of Pewee's Chop Shop across the UK. What are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, dream big, dream big. I mean, I love Gordon and Gino. Uh, you know, 
I, I watch a lot of their cooking to try and get inspiration and uh, dream big. I mean, TV show, I'd love to. And, um, you know, Gino and Gordon, if they'll have me, I'll, I'll be there. Uh, but no, yeah, like I say, I, I'm open-minded to everything. I want to, you know, educate myself as much as possible. And uh, I'd love to get involved in all that. I mean, um, it's, it's important to keep busy, especially mm -hmm. – you know, for everyone at this time, it's a difficult time for everyone. Um, I'm under no illusions it's difficult and everyone's in difficult situations and different situations financially or whether it be, you know, they, they haven't got family around them. But, you know, just try to keep, keep, keep that smile on your face and um, try and get out in the morning for a little bit of exercise because it brightens your mood and it, it makes you feel better about yourself. Good stuff. So uh, just before we go, we'll go through a few comments. And Steve Hensman, take a bow. What a pun. A few Fernley Winks. So I think that's quite <laughs> um, We've got a few questions that um, have been asked, and these are totally random, and we'll make these really quick because we are about to go. Uh, Chris Hubble, are you going to get a tattoo one day, Mark? <laughs> no, I'm not, to be fair, because I don't want my kids to get one when they're older. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Also, um, whereabouts do you get your hair cut? I saw, uh, I saw a comment from David Whitehead. Or, you know, did you do it yourself? Do, do you want to know the story about this? Have you been <laughs> your time? On, on. Oh, so yeah, um, I think it was about three, four weeks ago now. Um, me and the missus had one too few, one too many glasses of wine. Um, <laughs> And the next morning I woke up and I'd been absolutely butchered. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, when I looked in the mirror the next morning, I was shocked to say the least. So I'm waiting for it to grow back a little bit so I can get my barber to come and sort it out. <laughs> I didn't intend hilarious. this. I didn't intend this. Well, I've got to say, Mark, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Alex, have you got anything more to add or ask? Yeah, I mean, I see this uh, question at the bottom, and to be honest, it's actually blowing my mind. Um, so I'm interested to know the answer to this. If Eddie Howe was a culinary dish, what would he be and why? <laughs> I mean, what a question that is. <laughs> I might have to be careful with this one. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I'd go for a curry because his attention to detail is amazing. And to make a good curry, you need to sort of – you need a lot of good ingredients, a lot of good spices. And whereas spices, um, you know, you mix them together, they bring out the best flavours. And whereas Eddie I with his players, he gets the best flavour, doesn't he? <laughs> but has, he ever made you feel, has he ever made you feel absolutely awful the next day, though, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we've had a few run-ins, like, because as, as much as I'm, I'm a nice lad off the field, I do like a moan up on the training ground, as some of the lads will tell you. And we've had a couple of run-ins, but, yeah, after training, it's forgotten about. But, yeah, <laughs> if you step out of line, he'll let you know, uh, you know, he's boss. And that's what Tommy said, actually, a couple of weeks ago, which I was really surprised about. And um, a number of players, uh, Marvin Bartley, who we had on, said, you know, he's a nice guy, but he doesn't mince his words. And if you've done wrong or he's not happy with the way you performed, he, he will let you know. Is that right? Yeah, whether it's players or whether it's coaching staff, if the coaching staff aren't put, feeding the balls in correctly, he'll have a go at them. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a demand. He demands high standards and of himself as well. If he's not on it, he'll be you know, naffed off with himself. Whereas mm -hmm. if his players aren't performing well, whether it be in training or whether the drills aren't going as well as he'd like, he'll let you know about it and he will stop the session and he will embarrass you in front of the lads like and tell you, you know, you need to improve. Whereas that's why he's been successful because he demands the best and um, he's the nicest guy ever, approachable, um, uh, such an amazing guy. But yeah, on that training field, he expects the best and demands the best. Good stuff. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, mate. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Jeff, thank you. as well, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. It's been great talking with you, Mark. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you and, too. Nice to see you. And also Alex Deutsch as well. Thank you so much, mate. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. All the best for the future, Mark. Um, and yeah, um, all the best in your future endeavours on the pitch you know, off the pitch. I can't wait to read the book. Absolutely superb. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for everyone that's been leaving their messages and their comments on Facebook and YouTube. Really appreciate it. Once again, 
If you want to stay tuned, we've got a famous face from Pewee's era next Sunday night at eight o'clock and a bonus interview possibly in the week as well on YouTube. So if you are a Cherries fan back in the 80s, uh, you will know some of these players too. Um, just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Living Home Tech. They are professionals in the design and in installations of cinemas, networks, lighting, security systems, etc. Do visit their website at livinghometech.com dot co dot uk but thank you everyone for tuning in really appreciate it and we'll see you next time on back of the net of the cherries Oscar, back of the net! Oscar, back of the net!